Hi guys, Mike Lukic here and I'm back with another video. Today I'm going to do something a little different than I normally do. Instead of uh, a product demo or a solver based analysis, I'm going to spend some time walking through a tool that I use within my own analysis that I've decided to package up as a product for sale on my website. This is actually the second version of my flop analysis workbook that I'm going to be going through today, which is a product that examines equilibrium flop betting frequencies across a 184 sample of flops. Now I've taken all of that data and aggregated it into a number of different views to help better understand our incentives and key concepts in a variety of flop scenarios. So over the rest of this video, I'm going to spend some time discussing the inputs to the workbook, giving an overview of the components within, and exploring some of the ways in which people can use it as a foundational component of their own analyses. Before I actually jump into the workbook itself, I wanted to share a little bit of the backstory of how I created it in the first place. Back in June, I released the initial version of this workbook. What you're seeing on your screen is the product page on my website when this initial version was still live. Uh, and I had been working on this analysis for the better part of 2019 for my own study. After sharing it with some of my poker friends, they convinced me that there might actually be a market for this more broadly. So I decided to package it up on my own into a product. Uh, that first version was focused on these 200 big blind full ring games as that was my primary uh, non-pandemic focus while I was playing. Uh, and for this analysis, I solved 184 flops across 32 different formations within those 200 big blind deep full ring games uh, using my own strategy, so my own ranges, and my own estimate for the player pool's ranges and presented the equilibrium solutions as a part of the workbook. And I put it on my site in June for sale as, as a test to see if there really was demand for the product. And I learned two things from the feedback of the market. One, there definitely is a market for this type of work. I had some great feedback from those that purchased it and a lot of other interest from others who have reached out um, asking questions or uh, showing an interest in the product using a different set of ranges. Uh, and then the second thing I learned related to that last point there is that the data within the workbook is, is pretty specific to my own games, um, but that data may differ if I used other strategies. And I, I thought about that second point a lot. It's a fair and valid point. Um, after all, I used my own exploitative strategy as the input ranges. And if I'm comparing it to somebody else's strategy, or if I'm comparing the villains that I use to a different player pool, the output frequencies that I'm presenting may differ when I compare the two together. And consequently, some of the, the takeaways may not be the same. What I realized really was that initial product was perfectly customized to me, but somewhat less broadly applicable to a, a wider market. So that's when I realized that I needed a better baseline for the ranges. Now, at that point, I had already started playing online more. And this is, was after many of the poker rooms have, have, had already closed due to uh, COVID. So I was already starting to study 100 big blind ranges. Uh, it was not quite my, my comfort area. And I was learning some of the insights within those games as compared to the deeper full ring games that I normally played. Um, I had previously purchased an equilibrium preflop solution for uh, six max games and thought this might actually be a perfect use case for those ranges. Uh, after all, we're all trying to build a baseline strategy from which we can deviate in our own games. And what better baseline than developing one from a true equilibrium solution? So that's what I did. I, I took the learnings from my initial workbook and made some enhancements and then ultimately populated the data 
with solves using my preflop equilibrium solution. So I actually want to show a little bit about that preflop solution as a um, just to give a sense for the input uh, within all of these solves. So uh, let's jump over to PO. So when I look at PO here and I have a specific range, this is the under the gun opening equilibrium range uh, that I'm showing on my screen here. Uh, but I wanted to use my preflop solution um, as a as an input into this workbook. Uh, the preflop solution is based on an output solved using Munker Solver. Uh, as you can see uh, from my PO Solver window, uh, if you kind of look up here in my ranges, uh, I have this 100 big blind, six max equilibrium for all of these positions. So uh, big blind, button, cutoff, middle position, small blind, and under the gun. So these are our six positions at the table. And when I click into all of these, it has a wide variety of scenarios. So under the gun, I have my opening range, which you're seeing, um, and then how under the gun would respond versus a three bet from all of these individual players. How would under the gun respond versus a four bet versus all of these individual players. So really any scenario that you can think through for at a six max table, uh, this solution has preflop ranges for all of those uh, scenarios. Now, that's a lot of different formations and I didn't use all of them, but I did use a lot and I used 52 of them to actually be exact, which equates to basically every single raised and three bet pot scenario. And I solved all 52 of those formations for 184 different flops, which is almost 10,000 different flop solutions. And I aggregated all of that data together into one simple workbook. Now, there are a couple restrictions in the preflop solution, uh, namely calling preflop raises was really only permitted by the big blind and the button. So if you'll see here, uh, the cutoff here, when the middle position opens or the under the gun opens, the cutoff is only three betting or folding. Uh, middle position, same thing, is only three betting or folding to an open. And small blind here is only uh, three betting or uh, folding to an open. Um, sorry about that. Uh, whereas the button and big blind are also given a calling range. Uh, it's a fairly common strategy employed by a lot of regs, uh, but it should be noted that uh, since these other positions don't have calling ranges, that does affect its three bet ranges. So just something to keep in note that uh, this is uh, the one limitation of, of, of what these ranges are based off of, uh, primarily to model that specific strategy. You'll see here that there's a decent amount of mixing in the data. Uh, there's not really that much mixing here for some of these opening ranges. But specifically, even when you get into calling ranges here, and I'll just open up uh, the formation that I have here is an under the gun open versus a big blind call. But you'll see here when you jump into the big blind calling ranges here that there's a lot of mixing, right? So, you know, there are very few hands that are only purely calls. Uh, a lot of them are also somewhat mixed at, you know, some varying levels of frequencies into three bets and or folds, depending on what fringe you're actually looking at. Uh, the point here is not tr to try to mimic these ranges exactly. We all know that that is impossible to do so at the table. Uh, it, what it is meant to show is that the portions of these ranges that should be in the range at, in an equilibrium se setting. And you know, we or our opponents may be tighter or looser, uh, more aggressive or more passive in certain spots in, in actuality, and, and that's okay. We just have to learn how to then identify that while we're playing and then visualize how those deviations would shift our results as compared to this equilibrium baseline. So this, again, in, in essence, is a way for us to set an equi equilibrium baseline, saying that our big blind against that under the gun open is flatting 22.9% of combos or 303 combos. If you have a villain that is 
much wider than that, then you can adjust accordingly or much tighter than that, you can adjust accordingly. So I used these ranges uh, within PO Solver as my input and solved them 184 across 184 boards. Uh, I typically modeled this uh, a variety of different ways. I gave the aggressor preflop uh, two bet sizes, uh, a third pot and two thirds pot. And I gave the uh, defender preflop only a half pot bet size. And then on turns and rivers, I essentially uh, gave multiple bet sizes to uh, um, even things out across the rest of the game tree. Uh, if you uh, have any questions on the specific uh, details of the individual solves, let me know. Uh, if you also purchase the workbook itself, I uh, give screenshots of all of these uh, solution configurations so that you can actually uh, mimic this yourself or recreate this yourself uh, using your own solver work. So now I'd actually just like to jump into the output of these solves before actually finally jumping into the workbook. So if I jump over to the actual uh, workbook itself, uh, this is the workbook, every time I actually run one of those solves, one of these rows pops out. So this solve, what I have, what I'm showing here, this row that I'm highlighting is the output of the ace of spades, three of spades, two of diamonds flop on that, on the under the gun versus button formation at the root node. And you'll see here that there is a variety of outputs coming from that. So we can see for out of position and in position, what's our equity, uh, what's the EV, what's the um, EQR, which is our equity realization or how well in each position can uh, realize their equity. We also have the frequencies at which we are taking certain actions. So how frequently is the out of position player betting two thirds pot? And what's the EV of that decision? How frequently is the out of position player betting one third pot? And what's the EV of that decision? How frequently is the out of position checking? And what is the EV of that decision? So this is one row for one flop for one uh, formation. I did this for 184 flops for 52 different formations. So we see a lot of data in this workbook. And what this ultimately come, uh, came, came to be is this workbook. And that's what I wanna spend the rest of this time is we're walking through the actual workbook itself and show how we can take a lot of data, those 10,000 different rows and actually do something meaningful with it through the use of, of, of actual good data visualization, data aggregation, and data analysis. So the first tab of the workbook, you'll see at the bottom here that we have a number of different tabs. I'm not gonna go through every single one of them in detail, but I'll go through uh, a, a few of them as I demonstrate the components of the workbook. Uh, this first tab is is meant to be a summary. I give a little bit of a, an overview statement. Uh, there's some detail here in how to use the workbook itself. I've also linked to some of the supporting analyses that I wrote about on my website. Uh, we have some quick links here. So each of these individual tabs, you could actually uh, click on any one of these individual links and get to one of these tabs really quickly. So if I wanna just get to definitions, I might click the metric definitions and that will just take me to the second tab here, metric definitions. Uh, I have a little detail about uh, the version. So this is my uh, second version that I have uh, shared, uh, as well as some troubleshooting here. So uh, you'll see here that this is, it looks like Excel and this workbook was built in Excel, but to manage against uh, piracy, to manage and, and, and protect my IP here, uh, I have locked the workbook down to some degree. Uh, so. While you can type in the workbook and you know make changes to you know some of the numbers or cells that can actually affect some of the other outputs. 
so to protect against that, I've actually um, uh, limited the ability to actually save this workbook as is. If you actually want to take data in this workbook and use it yourself, you'd have to actually copy paste it into a separate workbook. But I, I just have some notes here in terms of either contacting me if you run into any issues with the workbook itself. Second tab is primarily just going into the definitions of all of the metrics that were used. So uh, I, you know, this, this is pretty straightforward. It's nothing really to dive into here, but you know, all of the metrics within the, the data outputs, I, I want to make sure that there is at least a, uh, a data dictionary for that. Now the summary tab here, this is uh, in essence, the 52 different formations that we actually solved. So this first row here is one formation. And what you can see here is uh, I actually have the file name here, um, the actual formation itself. So this is the under the gun versus the button single raise pot formations. Um, I ha I've grouped this up that so this is um, I'm looking at this from the under the guns perspective. Uh, I've all I'm always essentially looking at this from the first player's perspective here. So from this case here, I'm looking at under the gun versus button, a single raise pot. It's an out of position offense. So in this case here, the under the gun raised preflop, the button calls, the under the gun player is the aggressor with the uncapped range and is out of position. So out of position offense. All of these were starting with 100 big blind stacks. And we have a flop pot size here uh, for different uh, scenarios. So in this case here, under the gun opens to 2.5 big blinds, uh, big uh, big blind, or the button calls and both of the blinds fold, yielding a uh, pot size of 6.5 big blinds, which is an SPR of 14.9. And you can see this varies from board to board. I've also included ranges here. So you'll see that uh, we have our hero range, which is this first under the gun and the villain range, which is our button. And you can kind of see the, the weightings for some of these pieces in the villain range. Uh, you know, I don't expect people to be able to read the actual ranges here. What this is really helpful for is if you're doing this yourself, or if you want to dive into actually some of the individual solves or recreate some work yourself, you can just copy paste these ranges and into uh, GTO plus into PO solver into any solver, and it's going to build your uh, equilibrium range fairly quickly. And, you know, that's one formation. And we have that for 52 of them. So there are a variety of single raise pots and three bet pots. Um, I also have uh, limped pots just for uh, blind versus blind, which we'll get into in, in a little bit. And we have that for 52 different formations here. So again, a lot of different formations. I mentioned that I solved 184 flops. These are the 184 flops. So we have a little bit of detail about these 184 flops. Uh, I've numbered them all the way down. Uh, this is this 184 flop subset. I've, I've linked to it and I'll put a link in the notes below. It's the, uh, from the PO solver website, uh, meant to be a, uh, subset of flops that represent the entire uh, the entire game. So there's actually 1,755 unique flops that could come out at any given point in time. Uh, that would take a you know obviously I solved 10% of those uh, you know just a little bit over 10% of those of those flops solving all of these uh, scenarios for 1,755 different flops would take an enormous amount of resources and time to do so. Uh, not something that I uh, am ruling out at some point in the future, but uh, you know, what you'll see is that you know, the, more, uh, the more that we actually, this 184 flop subset is a fairly good representation of, of what we would see if we did solve all 1,755. So uh, that's what uh, this um, subset is, is used for. And this is used in a lot of other analyses that you can find um, across uh, that other folks have done themselves too. So within this table, you can actually see for each of these different uh, boards, I have some categorization here. So the first categorization I have is grouping. And you can, if I click on the filter here, you can actually see the different types of groups I have. Uh, you might recognize this if you've read any work that uh, Michael, Ace Michael Acevedo um, has done within his uh, excellent book, Modern Poker Theory. Uh, what this is, is grouping uh, the cards to ultimately uh, 
help try to, I guess, categorize them a little bit based on the rank of the cards. Uh, H is high, M is medium, L is low, and then Ace is its own special card. We, we've kept, kept Aces separately because Ace is kind of just a unique card itself, obviously, because it can be both high or low. Uh, um, so um, A is Ace. Uh, the high represents King, Queen, Jack, and 10. Uh, the medium represents 9, 8, 7, 6, and the low represents 5, 4, 3, and deuce. Uh, and that's going to lead us to a variety of these groupings uh, where all of these flops are categorized by one of those groupings. Uh, I have texture here, which is somewhat of a com combination of some of these other boards, but it's, you know, what are our overall textures of the board? So, you know, is this a monotone board? Is this a paired two-tone board, a paired rainbow board, rainbow? a trips board, or just an unpaired two-tone board. So um, there's a variety of different texture options that we can group here. Uh, there's, uh, I've have these three categorizations of full houses, flushes, and straights. It's meant to group things based off of what is actually available on the flop. So uh, paired boards, um, uh, trips, and unpaired it would be for full houses. Flushes would look at two-tone, monotone, and rainbow boards, and then straights would look at um, is a gut shot present, is no straight, is nothing present, is an open-ended straight draw present, or is a flopped straight actually present here. So I've categorized this a bunch of different ways, and we'll actually see on some of the subsequent tabs how we can actually use those categories to uh, drive some of the analysis. I've also uh, aggregated up these boards across each of the different groupings so we can see how they're broken out. So these 184 flops, uh, within these 184 flops, two of them are trips, 31 of them are paired flops, and 151 of them are unpaired flops. Um, of these 184 flops, 73 of them are rainbow, 96 of them are two-tone, and 15 of them are monotone, etc. So this is just giving a little bit more information about the flops themselves. The next tab here is actually when we start getting into the data itself. So what this tab is meant to show is the components of at a high level of all of the formations. So without getting into any of the individual details or getting into any of the individual flops themselves, what are the frequencies and how does EV distribute within each of these different formations. Now I've grouped them here into these different four different buckets here. And I, I wrote about this on this grouping on my website, uh, but they're either offensive in position. So this is the situation like under the gun, open and a big blind flats. Offense out of position, which is that under the gun versus button scenario we just discussed. Uh, defense in the position, which is, is the... Um, is uh, a button flat versus an under the gun open. So this is kind of the inverse of this under the gun open versus big blind or versus a uh, button flat. And then finally, there's defense out of position again, which is big blind open versus under the gun. Uh, sorry, big blind flat versus under the gun open. And this is the inverse of that under the gun open versus big blind flat. I've also included here the limp pots from the small blind perspective and from the big blind perspective. Now for each one of these individual formations, we can see what I have here first is the EV distribution. So uh, for all of our flops, how is EV distributed across these different flops? Meaning what percentage of the pot, uh, and I like this metric EV percentage, which is what percent of the pot do we actually earn um, at equilibrium? If our EV percentage is greater than 60% here. So we're saying here under the gun versus big blind, it's a fairly advantageous board for us. We already knew that. But all across our 184 flops, there are 138 of them where we have greater than 60% EV, uh, we earn greater than 60% of the EV. 37 of these boards, we earn between 50 and 60% of the EV. Um, and there's actually nine boards where we earn less than 50% EV. So, you know, right off the bat, it might be useful to understand, well, what are these boards? 
where we earn less than 50% at equilibrium. And those might be boards where we're going to want to examine a little bit and may have to take some more passive strategies, even though we have an overall equity edge uh, against the big blind in a variety of scenarios. Moving on, I have information about the formation themselves. So what's our pot size? What's our SPR? I have some success metrics here. So for each formation, what's the equity of our overall range? Um, how much EV do we earn from our flop solutions across all 184 flops on average? Uh, what percentage of the pot is that worth? So, you know, on average here, we're earning 3.55 big blinds on a three point on a, sorry, on a 5.5 big blind pot. Uh, we're earning 65% of the pot here um, on a on an aggregate level. So not only are we uh, um, uh, do we have an equity advantage here because our equity is is almost 58%, but we're also over realizing our equity because our share of the pot is actually even higher than our equity. So we can start seeing some of these metrics at that formation level, uh, and then within each of these. Uh, the last two sections here, we dive into the actual frequencies at uh, at the aggregate level here. So um, versus the big blind here uh, as the under the gun, um, we are expecting a check at equilibrium the majority of the time, meaning that our villain leads into us only 6% of the time here. They're, they're checking the majority of the time, which makes sense, again, because the big blind is going to have a, a much weaker range than under the gun. Uh, when the villain does check, uh, we are betting large or betting two thirds here 24% of the time. We are betting one third or smaller 44% of the time and checking back uh, just under a third of the time here. So we can see how these frequencies look at the overall formation level. And then for the 6% of the time that the villain leads, how often do we raise? We raise 6%, we call 67%, and we fold 27% uh, of the time. So what this here is just for one row, we're looking at the equilibrium frequencies aggregated across all 184 flops for this formation. And we do that for all 52 formations here. Now, you know, again, that this is very high level, and it's not going to necessarily tell us how to play any individual hand. But what it can do here is give us a sense for our overall incentives and our overall um, and what we can expect as a baseline across all boards at each individual formation. So now that when we're, at, when we're actually d diving into some of the individual boards or individual types of boards, we can compare them to the average and start understanding, is this board better or worse than the overall average or overall baseline for that individual formation? Now, the next bunch of tabs here that are red are in essence, kind of similar to one another, and they are more forms of the same tab. So you'll see here that I have, again, in position offense, out of position offense, in position defense, out of position defense. For each one of these individual tabs here, I have actually two tabs. I have an IP offense macro, IP offense micro. Then I have an OOP offense macro, OOP offense micro, et cetera. What this is saying is that for each of these individual buckets, I have two tabs to dig into them. I have a macro level tab and a micro level tab. So what I'm going to do is for the rest of this video, I'm going to walk through the um, in position offense macro micro level tab and then just show that the rest of the workbook is essentially the same. What you'll see here is when I go to this macro level tab, um, you're actually going to see now a little bit of a deeper dive view. So the first thing you'll see is that we have this um, option here to select a formation. So I have this drop down and you'll see here now that I have under the gun versus big blind highlighted. I can select any one of my formations here. So let's say maybe I want to look at uh, three bet pots and I want to look at um, button versus under the gun three bet pots. So when I click that, the rest of this workbook now changes based off of the selection that I chose. So now the formation detail shows that the pot size is a little bit larger. It's 18.5 big blinds and my SPR is uh, 4.9. Uh, 
what I surface here is this row is the same as on the previous tab. So this is the average across all 184 flops to use as a baseline when comparing to the rest of the components within this workbook. So if you see here, my equity is 52.7, my EV is 11.56. If I go back to the formations and this is uh, button versus under the gun, when I highlight this row, you'll see that my equity is 52.7, my EV is 11.56. So it's gonna, this is going to align with the data on the previous tab. But now I can actually see the same metrics on the previous tab. So my EV distribution, my success metrics, my frequencies, now broken out by my different types of groups. So um, how does that look on monotone boards, two-tone boards, rainbow boards, paired rainbow boards, etc. How does this look on unpaired versus paired boards? How does this look on flushes, rainbow uh, on, on rainbow boards or two-tone boards? How does this look on the different groupings? Um, so now I can start actually diving into some more actionable insights here by looking at the ways in which I might categorize flops in game. It's easy it, it's, it's somewhat more abstract to look at all flops in game and just look at it at a formation level. But now I can start making some insights as to do I bet more or less on different types of boards and more importantly, start to understand why does the solver choose to bet more or less on certain types of board here. So, you know, I think what would be interesting is, you know, going back to our initial under the gun versus big blind um, scenario here, we started asking the question, what are those nine boards that we are earning less than 50% of the pot? They are um, a mixture of two-tone and rainbow boards here, and they're all unpaired, and they all have a straight present. So uh, we'll dive into the actual specific boards themselves. And you can also see here that they're all either medium, medium, low, medium, low, low, or low, low, low boards. So that tells us a lot. And we'll dive into the specific boards themselves. But this is telling us that on unpaired boards that are a nine, where all three cards are, are a nine or lower, and there is a straight present, the under the guns range is going to have less coverage than the big blind and you know the under the gun overall is going to have le is going to earn less than 50% of the pot at equilibrium uh, against the big blind so in this case here when the board comes out and it meets these set of criteria we may want to act more cautiously on, on those boards so I, I, a couple things I just want to call out here. I have some conditional formatting on this. So um, I'm highlighting cells green if they are greater than um, one standard deviation above the average of the cells within their block. And I highlight them red if they're greater than one standard deviation below the average uh, of the cells within this block. So, you know, just something to note um, as if you kind of are wondering why certain cells are green and certain cells are red. Uh, I also have these kind of, I, I like these uh, little bars here to, you know, start visualizing this as a bar graph um, of how often we're checking, betting, um, um, folding, et cetera. Uh, this is all based off of 100. So you can see here that you know these bars are completely full here almost because we're checking almost 100% of the time or villain is checking almost 100% of the time. And it's going to be based off of uh, the, the size of this. So rather than look at this as a big table, you can start quickly seeing you know these two boards here. So um, on two-tone and rainbow boards, uh, we are we have a portion of our range here that wants to be betting larger here on the flop in this under the gun versus big blind scenarios here. But on paired boards or monotone boards or trip boards, uh, we're not gonna necessarily be betting as often um, for a large sizing. So really they have to be unpaired boards here. And you can kind of see this if you dive into just the unpaired versus paired versus trips. Um, those unpaired boards were betting a little bit larger more often. Um, the uh, paired boards and trips boards 
presumably because uh, our opponent um, is also going to have uh, you know, those boards tend to be a little bit more uh, static and um, our opponent is also going to have uh, um, a portion of, of, of you know trips or full houses or in their range uh, there so in that case there it's going to be um, a little bit more challenging here for us to be um, polarizing with a portion of our range so you know this is essentially this um, this tab here this macro levels to look at all of these flops um, kind of aggregated at different levels the micro is Let's just dive into the individual flops themselves. So, uh, you know, this is kind of the the final tab of of the workbook here for this component. And you'll see that the the formation here. I can't change the 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 formation on this micro tab. I actually have to change it on the macro tab, um, mainly because I think you look at the macro tab and micro tab together. But when I jump into the micro tab now of the under the gun versus big blind. I can start looking for each individual flop these same exact metrics. So equity, EV, EV percentage, e, um, EQR, and then the frequencies. Now, the great thing about the this tab is that you actually have filtering functionality. So what you see here is if you scroll down, there's 184 boards on, on, on this analysis here. And that's a lot to actually look at for individual boards themselves. But you can see a few things here. So one, you can actually sort. So suppose I actually want to sort by the boards in which I actually earn the largest share of the pot. Well, I can pick one of these. Um, I can pick my row here for EV percentage and sort this largest to smallest. And what you'll see here is now, instead of you're going to see my index changes it's a little bit jumbled up, uh, but what this is sorted by this column here, and now I can see the boards in which we actually earn the most, and um, I can start maybe looking at the actual uh, flops themselves. I may be able to look at the specific categorization themselves and start scrolling down to see which boards do I earn the most. Uh, conversely, I can also sort this smallest to largest and see which boards am I earning the least, and you know you'll see that these are the, and there, there is a bit of rounding here. So it's uh, these six boards here, or these sorry, these nine boards here are the boards where our EV is less than 50%. Uh, but um, again, just as we've talked about here, this is the, the 543, 764, 765, 865, 865, etc. So, you know, these kind of small connected boards here aren't very favorable to our, our range versus our opponent's range. Um, again, similar, we can start seeing, uh, you know, what are the boards where we can expect a villain to lead more often, right? So, you know, they're going to coincide with some of these um, boards where we earn less EV. Uh, but, you know, at equilibrium here, if I look at this five, four, three, two-tone board, um, our opponent is leading 60% of the time at equilibrium, which, you know, I'll call out that we virtually, that we will never see 60% uh, um, leading frequencies in actuality, uh, but that's what our opponents should be doing here at equilibrium uh, in this scenario here. So uh, we can adjust accordingly based off of um, how we actually think our opponent is playing in game versus uh, what they're supposed to be doing at equilibrium here. Um, so we can, I, I've gone through kind of how you can actually sort things. Uh, you can also use uh, the selective filtering functionality. So let me just go back to the index at normal. So suppose I actually only wanted to look at boards that are uh, two-tone boards. So I might go in here to my flush category here and I can pick two-tone, monotone, or rainbow. I'll just take this checkbox and uncheck it and then select two-tone and hit okay. And now the rest of this is going to be filtered so that it's only going to show me two-tone boards. So now I can study for two-tone boards and only look at two-tone boards as a part of my analysis. Uh, suppose, I, and I've given this example in the past before, but you know, I, I always find one board, one set of boards that I find super interesting are ace wheel wheel boards. So you know, I can, if I wanted to study those, I can use my filtering functionality and choose ace low low boards and study only these ace low low boards and start seeing how 
my metrics change across the different uh, for uh, the different flops within the ace low low board. So again, there's a lot of different ways that I can actually use this, but I can actually um, uh, filter and sort a lot of this data to analyze it in, in different ways and um, help me kind of get the insights that I actually um, want to get. Uh, finally, the last thing I'll, I'll just cover is, is, you know, while you can type in this and you can type and do things all you want, and it's going to it, things may change a little bit in the workbook. Uh, that's okay. Uh, I again, I've made this so that uh, you can't actually um, save this. So you, what will just happen is you end up closing this workbook out, and when you reopen it, uh, it just opens up with the normal data. Uh, what you can do though is you can actually take this and right click and actually copy the data. So when you um, actually copy the data itself, uh, what is, uh, you can actually paste this into one of your own workbooks uh, and to do further analysis. And uh, you know, that's one of the best part of the best feedback that I've gotten so far from others who have used my initial workbook is that uh, this is a great jumping off point. And that's what I'm hoping that this is, is a great resource and a great jumping off point for people who want to take this analysis to the next level. Uh, you know, for those who, but for those who just want to use this workbook them as on them um on its own it's got a lot of fantastic information uh where you really can learn a lot of concepts by looking at the different frequencies and our different success metrics across uh, all the way at the highest level which is the the formation level uh down to a somewhat aggregated or segmented level um, and then getting down to the actual individual flop level. So there's there's three different kind of levels of granularity that you can do so for each of the individual formations and you can dive into a lot of information um, within this workbook uh, by doing so. So that concludes my walkthrough of the workbook. It's live now and on sale and on my site. Uh, so I've taken down the 200 big blind solution workbook and replaced it with this 100 big blind equilibrium solution. Uh, I, as I mentioned at the top of the hour, uh, it's really more beneficial, I think, to, to start with the equilibrium baseline here. I may create a 200 big blind equilibrium solution, but that's not in more of my immediate plans. Uh, so the solution is live on my website. The pricing is $250 for the workbook. Uh, for $350, I'll include a one hour personalized coaching session where I'll actually walk through the workbook uh, with you. And you know, I've built the workbook to be somewhat flexible to various inputs. Um, I can recreate the workbook for any set of ranges. As I mentioned again, uh, I think personalized is, is better, but only if it's personalized to you. So if you'd like to talk about how, getting this workbook populated using your own ranges, uh, just send me an email. Um, you can go to my contact form at lukic.io and we can discuss uh, some customized solution pricing. So, that concludes the uh, my presentation today. Uh, again, if you have any questions about the workbook, um, if you have any comments or feedback for me, uh, send me a note at uh, at my contact info on my website. Uh, leave a comment in the uh, notes below. Uh, hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. Um, I've been trying to grow this channel a little bit, and you know I'm I'm appreciative of, of all of that. So. Uh, you know, if you like what you see, definitely hit the like and subscribe button. Uh, thanks for the time today. And, you know, if you'd like to buy this workbook, go to my website at lukic.io, where I have that and a variety of other data, um, data related writing and video content. Uh, thanks again and have a great rest of your day.